Events happen that change our lives. Dealing with change is what we do. We discuss with industry professionals objective solutions to work through cherished items and family memories. When we go beyond the gavel, we provide tools and information to deal with these crisis times. Hello, welcome back to Beyond the Gavel. I'm Shane Feely with Auction Solutions, and again we have Mr. Monty Schatz. We were talking in our last session about agricultural land and how that uh, affects the family when there have been three or four children and a mom and a dad, and mom and dad have be become deceased, or the one son has taken over the farm, or the one daughter, and how that affects how it all falls after that. So Monty, you were kind of talking about how some of the workings go. What if the one who's been farming all these years and paying everybody decides, I'm done? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And that goes into the importance of, uh, of building contingencies in either the trust or the estate plan on what happens if that, that does happen. Is there, uh, you know, was the goal of the decedent to keep the land and the family, even if it wasn't the person who was actively managing the farm, even if he or she isn't going to stay on the farm. So you can build in, you can build in uh, clauses in, in an estate plan, such as a first right of refusal. So if Johnny or Jane, the active child that was, at, the child that was actively f uh, on the farm, farming the, uh, with the parents sure. and so forth, decides I'm done, I'm ready to retire, I'm tired of it, you know, I want to, you know, I want to become an action star hero in Hollywood or whatever their goal yeah. might be. Uh, they, they want, they, they want, they're done and they want to be off the, uh, off the farm. Um, you can put a provision for a first right of refusal to the other children. You can establish a benchmark based on, on the value of the land or maybe the value at, at the date of death, whatever the, the, you know, the heirs could agree upon in target or whatever was outlined in the trust by the deceased person. So that's, that's a critical thing to put in there because life changes, people change. You know, uh, I think a lot of people, particularly in farming, and I don't mean this disparagingly or critically, uh, you know, I think we all like to envision that the status quo is gonna be in place and yes, my son or daughter is going to love being on this land and they're going to, you know, they will drop dead in the middle of the field to keep keep this land Absolutely. and the family, but all of a sudden life changes. You know, a spouse passes away, they lose the desire. We were just talking offset about one person who farmed with his father and it was, uh, you, know, you know, 95 years old and he died and, and, you know, he just said enough, I'm tired and, and uh, you know, I would suspect a piece of that was dad wasn't around, so the, the, the fuel wasn't, you know, you know, the fuel that fired sure. the flame wasn't there anymore as much. So those things change. So there should be contingency provisions in there if it's desired that you keep in the family, that at least there's a shot, but not make it so to keep the farm in the family. But if there isn't the financial wherewithal and or the desire of any of the children to do that, well then at least, you know, you can have the escape clause after all of them have rejected that first right and they can put it up for sale then, and then, then we start talking about the tax planning and all that from there, so, sure. yeah. So if they choose not to put the land up for sale, but they may choose to sell all the equipment, would then they it inquire as to farm management, and how does that work? Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's a couple of options there. Uh, uh, you know, again, it depends upon the family dynamics. Now, if the person who farmed the land, uh, you know, the heir that farmed the land, the brother or sister in this case uh, that we've been using, example we've been using, um, has familiarity, it might make sense for them to be the hands-on driver that, because they probably know the neighbors who would have the most interest in renting the land. Sure. They may, you know, and not to be, not to discount or be dismissive of farm management services because they are valuable. Uh, but, you know, if you have somebody that's hands-on, has high integrity, knows, knows the market, um, knows how to manage this, uh, you know, well as far as getting good tenants on there, sure and whether it makes sense to cash rent or crop share and all that and, and have the oversight, th that person may be able to do that. And then um, as the rents come in and so forth, you have to have one of the designated uh, persons and that might be in the trust agreement. There sure. may be a provision in there that says it goes through the trust and the trustee handles those payments and so forth. The one thing I would recommend to all people, and this is a little bit of the cynical side, 
because we are dealing about with relatives here typically, but I, I would make sure there is some kind of what I would call dual control, check and balance there. Um, you know, thieves are brothers and sisters to somebody sometimes even, you know, and, and I know that sounds a little bit strong, but if there's somebody that's tempted or they all of a sudden they start self-justifying and saying, well, you know, if we had a farm manager, they would be getting 10% of this for this. Well, maybe I should do that. And, and that's fine. But, but again, it goes back to my basic premise of transparency. Sure. If you're thinking that as a relative and, and if you're thinking you're, you should merit that, that should be talked about at the front end if it's not already dressed in that. the trust absolutely. agreement. Absolutely. Talk about it beforehand. Oh, Maybe the rest absolutely. of them think it ought to be eight and you can agree on eight, yeah. but it's something better than nothing. Yeah, and make sure, again, if you don't have a professional farm manager, a professional farm manager is going to provide that that quarterly report or sure. monthly or semi-annual, whatever frequency they do it on. And that's going to be all in there and typically audited and so forth to make sure that all the parties know you know, what's the revenue coming in, what are the expenses going out, and what's my share of the rent going Absolutely. to be. Absolutely, right. Shouldn't be any different if it's a family member that t assumes that mantle of farm management. Same thing, reporting, accountability, transparency, best litigation avoidance tools in, in, in the world. Absolutely, keep you know. really good records. Yeah, That's Absolutely. Right. So what if you do have a, a PR go rogue? How do, you, how do you track that and how do you stop them? Uh, PR or a trustee if they go broke. Go rogue. Oh, go rogue. I'm sorry. When they when they have decided that they deserve that and maybe more and yeah. how, how long does it take to catch someone like that if you don't have an accountant that you that you use all the right. time? I mean, if you have to go back forensically and find it and that can be quite expensive. I, you know, there's there's a legal recourse for that, but I'm going to start and remind me to get back to the legal recourse. So I'm going to start with the practical. Um, the practical start, telltale signs. You're not getting, I mean, even if it's just a simple spreadsheet and, and you're not getting a report uh, on a regular basis and you asked the sibling that's assumed the farm management role or whoever's doing it to provide you that report and there's reluctance or I'll get back to you and after multiple attempts, no response. Uh, that's a red flag. You know? Sure. Uh, you know, if you're doing your job as somebody that's overseeing the land, especially if you're the person that used to farm it, unless you, you are absolutely lacking in any basic accounting acumen, you know, and skill set, that shouldn't be that hard to pull no, together and get together. So. And if you can't do it, then, you know, hire a bookkeeper or, or, and or an accountant that can do that because those shouldn't be that difficult of calculations realistically. Sure. I mean, farming is complicated. But when you're going to break it down to the basic income in, rental income, whether it's crop share, crop share gets a little more complicated, obviously, than a cash rent. But, uh, you know, what's the income coming in on that? You know, what was our, our share of the input for fertilizer, seed, herbicide, you know, irrigation, if irrigation's involved in those types of expenses? Um, you know, it, it, you should have an accounting for that and you should know what it's going to be. If there's some significant delay, in redistribution of the rents once we know what the hopeful profitability sure. is of the, of the land. That should be a telltale sign. And I, you know, where I would always start is simply request, you know, like most of us would do verbally or informally, if you will. Uh, you know, I haven't seen, you know, I thought the rents were supposed to be paid out. Any profits from the rent of, of the land was supposed to be paid out in this state. Haven't heard from you. Don't really know where the land is going. Um, you know, where the land is, uh, you know, what the income is on this, haven't heard from you. And then I, you know, I wouldn't wait a significant amount of time. I'd just say, sure, like to see something in a couple weeks. If you don't get a response then, then I, I would say d do a formal demand in writing. And that, that's where you're starting to position yourself for trouble down the road. Oh, absolutely. You've got to have that evidence that shows you, yeah. you know, you ask them about it and you're not getting that. And then if things still continue to be delayed, and obscured and you're not getting a clear answer, uh, then at that point, I, I think, un, you know, unfortunately for the parties involved, you may have to engage the services of an attorney. Right. And you may have to demand an accounting and you may, uh, in a, and that is a formal proceeding recognized by statute where you go in there and you file a suit and you demand an accounting from that, 
that agent sure. to provide that. And if they can't do that at that point, you know, the, the, then the, the burden of proof is going to shift to that, that person managing the farm to, to show where the finances are and hopefully deliver a check. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if they don't, well, then at that point, I think, uh, I, I think you have a basis for an order to have them removed and you'd get a third party in there. And I think when you get to that point, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule for every scenario, but if you've had somebody that's an insider, if you will, a relative, um, then I think it's time to get a professional third party sure. neutral in there. And I think, frankly, again, I, I, I don't want the audience to think that uh, the goal should be to circumvent a farm manager. In a lot of cases, trust the siblings trust each other or sure. not, their harmonious relationships or not. A lot of times, a farm manager is a really good way to go. Um, they, they are very hands-on, and particularly if you don't have somebody in the family that has some agricultural background or acumen, or they're far removed from it, uh, you know, I, I grew up a farm kid in northern South Dakota, but I, I, I wouldn't even dream of thinking about uh, uh, you know, trying to tackle and know all the sure. nuances of the agricultural industry and marketing grain and, and, you know, futures contracts and those things that can make for a more profitable farm operation. The world's changed completely back when, uh, you know, I can't, when they came down with the Ten Commandments from the mountain and I saw them, you know. Uh, oh, you're not been, that old. Uh, you know, what I grew up, I grew up, spent summers on the farm and I'll tell you, it was, to me, it was very simple. We planted corn, we got the corn put up, put up hay, had animals, fed them, took care of them, took them to market, and we scratched out a living. You wouldn't worry about anything because it was a very simple time. Yeah, if, if not today. If only, well, it, you know, and not, not today, and I'm not even so certain then, because I, I would guess if we would have told our parents or our relatives that were on the farm to show us the invoices and the books, we might have realized it's not as simple <laughs> as, it, as right. it looks. But it, it has become like more it. sophisticated. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you know, you have precision agriculture oh, now. Oh, man, and, they, and, I know, and, and they're and, measuring you know, seeds per inch. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, you know, the, the mapping that shows the soil content and where you need to put different chemicals on this part of it and all that and that's that's all expensive and then like I said back in the day I think I don't think the use of you know futures contracts or those types of things were as common either and now you know your more sophisticated uh, farm families are using a lot of those techniques and I don't know if I, I don't think I'd be qualified to handle that. Well, that I can tell you this, I won't complain about the farmers. I know what it takes to get that job done nowadays and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, you know? I mean, the, the, the level of hard work and, and frankly, the level of sophistication in, in agriculture has just hit an all new high. And again, that's why coming, circling back to what we're talking about in estate planning and trust work, that's why it's so critical that the person that has a farm that had, uh, creates, works with their attorney to create the tools that will give the flexibility to the trustee to utilize those resources, put provisions in the trust, uh, particularly if you know uh, one of the children isn't going to take it over or they, they may be great farmers. I mean, we, you know, we see this in all professions. They may be great farmers. You might be a great doctor, but that's not the person you necessarily want to have managing the books or right. doing the financial well, end of it. Right. So why not put in place the tools of success that give a trustee the power to employ agents or you know, if they need some, some kind of agent in there to assist the person that's sure. farming or hire a bookkeeper that does the QuickBooks or an accountant that does more sophisticated level of bookkeeping so that person on the farm can focus best on what they do. Putting those two, uh, what they do best, which is farming and and, and le leave the bookkeeping to somebody else if they don't have the desire to do that. It just increases your, your potential for success. Oh, absolutely. So we're gonna go back to some of our trust issues and trust questions that I had for you earlier. There's sometimes a tug of war be between spending and investing for, li investing for life interests for mm -hmm. a trust and mm -hmm. the beneficiaries and just for the person themselves who wants to be able to retire and live off of what they've you know, manage to save and invest and things right. like that. Right. Um, who's the responsible person to advise on distribution? There's a lot of ways that that can be uh, structured depending upon the complexity of the family dynamics and the type of assets that you have within a trust. The, the age old prob uh, challenge 
with trusts is that you, you have these parties. You have what we call the grantor or the settler, the person that created the trust, typically the person that's generated the wealth. Okay. Okay. And then you have this, this party called a trustee, and that's the person who would be responsible for managing the trust, either during life and or after death. Then you have this third group called the beneficiaries. Um, and the beneficiaries are where we talk about those that have the life interests that get to retain the benefits of the trust during life, and it can be an individual or a whole group of individuals. And you have these remainder beneficiaries, which after a certain event, after, if the trust says after 10 years, this trust shall dissolve and it's distributed, that goes to those remainder beneficiaries. Or the more typical situation you have is when the uh, person for whose benefit the trust was created for life passes away and that triggers the event where the trust either stays in trust for these remainder or future beneficiaries or it distributes outright. Now, Typically during life, most trusts are structured, uh, uh, a significant amount of them are revocable trusts, and, the, and we call them grantor revocable trusts. The person that created the wealth sets it up, and that usually allows maximum flexibility. They can take whatever they want out of the trust, put whatever in the tr they want into the trust uh, on, on command. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that created it. So that, that's, that's the easy part. Then, then this, this little, this little event called death comes in, typically death. Um, and that person that created that trust, it's no, lo no longer needed, obviously, because that person's passed away. And that's where the provisions kick in for the future beneficiaries, or what we call the remainder mm -hmm. beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sometimes you have the other type of trust where you have you know, a part of it that goes for income for the health care support and maintenance of a, of a surviving spouse or some other party, but it can also be used for, for, for other parties that are primarily going to be future beneficiaries but might also be able to have access to some of it then. Okay. Well, now here's where you get into the challenge, okay, um, and that is uh, the typical language you have in a trust is that a trust established for the health care, support, maintenance, and education. Now there's several variations on that theme, but that's generally the big five that you look at. It's broadly worded, to, so you know, the, the, the trustee can be flexible and can look at the circumstances of the income beneficiary, but if there are other beneficiaries that also have access to income and principal, that we can look at them and, and if the income isn't enough to sustain all the above beneficiaries, then we can then we can look at principal as well too, and so that puts a tremendous onus and burden on on the trustee. This person is a person that's got to figure out one how to appropriately invest those assets, and two when those requests for distributions come, uh, you know, and it's coming from multiple sources, you know. What are the most valid reasons? What is the what is the distribution I should make that would be prudent and would carry out the person's intent that created the trust? So while they're living, it might be a nursing home, it yeah. might be yeah. a visiting nurse, nurse or yeah. some kind At of home health assistant care type of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So obviously those are going to take precedent over anything else. But let's so if you the person passes then. Mm -hmm. Tell me some of the things that can happen when you have a lot of beneficiaries and they don't know what their role is or what the trustee's role is. Yeah, so the one thing that should be made clear, and again, a lot of problems can be resolved, assuming you're dealing with reasonable, rational beneficiaries, which isn't always the case, but you know, uh, you sit, can be resolved with transparency. These are the assets that are in the trust. In fact, in, under Nebraska law, once a trust becomes irrevocable, you are, the trustee is required to send out a notice to all of them that there is this revocable trust, that, the, the, that there are assets in the trust, that the beneficiary has a right to receive information, regular accountings from the tr trustee, and, and um, and you know don't wear the addresses of the trustee so they can contact them and so forth so going back to our situation the problems that you can run into are as varied as the family dynamics 
So let me give you a classic example I've run into. Uh, this day we have a lot of people that are married more than once. They have blended families. They, they might have a, the person that created the trust might have a 34-year-old child who is self-sufficient, a successful professional in their own right, and are pretty well established. And then on the other end of the spectrum, they might have children from a second marriage who aren't even age of majority yet. They're eight, nine years old. Mm -hmm. They've got all their expenses associated with growing up, um, you know, and getting to that point where they go to college. I'd say being on your own, but I don't know a lot of kids that are on their own totally when they go to college. But, but, uh, but now they got all these college expenses. Then let's take another dynamic. Let's say that, okay, so, so you know, dad I know would have wanted my children. The 34-year-old now has their own children, grandchildren. They want them to be taken care of as well too. The trust hopefully will address that. But, but now you've got this, the, the, this group of kids that are younger that have higher needs at this point. Then- With a second marriage. With a second marriage, yeah. For example, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, uh, and, the, and then you might also have the, you know, the surviving spouse too. Sure. You know, okay. So all of a sudden, the relationship between stepmom and stepchildren may not be quite as uh, warm as they once were when we get into the sink. Now, you compound that with, you have all these children, let's say younger children, let's throw in there one, one wants to go to a community college, which is typically far less expensive, and you have one kid that's a brainiac and wants to go to Princeton. Wow, you know, Big let's difference. see, sixty-five thousand a year versus eight thousand a year. Mm. How are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna, you know, and 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 there's nothing that says a trust has to be equal. So now here's where the trustee really has got to kick into gear, and 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 what a trustee, if they're really doing their job correctly, needs to do, they got to be, they, they got to first of all, they got to explain to all the beneficiaries that I'm not your legal advisor versus stepmom's legal advisor versus, you know, child from first marriage's legal advisor. You, you, you have to be Switzerland. You gotta be that, yep. that neutral party. DMC. Now some people would call that as being the cold and different trustee, but in many circumstances it's necessary. I mean, you, you have to maintain a level of being above the fray to sure, look at things absolutely. objectively. So you need to communicate that to all the beneficiaries at that point in time so they understand. My job is to look out for this trust Granted, it's for all of your benefit, but I can't play favorites with any of you. Sure. I've got to look at this like Switzerland. Then the second thing that has to happen is, is that the trustee has to look at how they invest it. Does it need to be more for growth for the future? And there's got to be a balance that creates current income maybe to meet the current income needs, plus some growth for when that day comes when the trust does distribute that there's some growth. Or else you're going to have some future beneficiaries that aren't going to be happy if there isn't some growth in there. But then the, then the third thing, and, and this is specific to the question you had about distributions, you have to get a process in place. The, what the law always looks at when they look at if a trustee is, is doing prudent administration is fulfilling their fiduciary obligation, which is the gold standard in the law for whether sure. a trustee is doing his or her job correctly or its job correctly if it's a bank. And, and, and that is collecting information. So if Johnny comes up and says, I want to go to Princeton, and by the way, I'm going to need some wheels to go there, and I need to have a brand new Corvette to do there, do that, wow. okay. That's well, all. Yeah. You know, and obviously I'm being a little bit facetious there and, and extreme. No, but you're but, right. I mean, I'm sure the demands can become unreasonable. Yeah, they, they can be. And, uh, but the thing is, regardless of whether it's a, a more modest request or that one that's kind of the more far out example, maybe, and not the norm, um, what the trustee has to do, it's, it's obligatory on them. When you're looking at health care, support, maintenance, and education, you got to look at that particular beneficiary's resources, their own. So you, you should be requesting a financial statement from that. Now that's going to sound cruel, like, well, if dad were alive, he, he would have never asked me for a balance sheet and an he income statement. just wrote a check. Yeah, exactly. He would have, you know, may have written the check, but, or he may have more informally just said no to, you know, <laughs> we'll Imagine see. That. You know, but, but the point is, is that you have to have that documentation that shows what are, what is this yeah. beneficiary's true need? What is their outside resources? And, and does it fall within the standards? And, and, 
you know, health care, support, maintenance, and education, you know, does health mean the local hospital or does it mean you got to pay an out, huge out-of-pocket expense for something to go to the Mayo Clinic, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, just as an no. extreme example, you know, uh, you know, support, what does that mean? The support that, some trusts use the language support that I'm, that, that my child has been accustomed to. Well, you know, if they were living a more prosperous, if you will, more so, higher social economic status, that might mean, that may give the trustee more liberty to be more generous. Okay. But, you know, the standard I always look at is, and, and, and the law looks at, frankly, is what is the person who passed away, the testator or the trustor, the person that died, that set up these vehicles, what was their intent? What would they have seen what these children wanted to do? And, and a part of that is you've got, to look at, you've got to look at history, but similarly, the trustee has a tough job of they also got to look into the future, meaning how many resources, how much of resources do I have to spread around with all these conflicting, potentially conflicting beneficiary sure. needs to make it? Because one of the things that's really difficult for some, some heirs or beneficiaries to get used to is you know, mom or dad might have had an income of, you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year, that while they were living, that all has replenished itself. Well, now they're gone. They might have two, three, four million in trust, but that is a finite number, and odds are you're not going to have investments that are on four million that are going to kick off five, six, seven hundred thousand no. a year, year in and no, year out. No, absolutely. Now you've got a more limited pool of resources, unless you're you're that individual that was just in a whole new stratosphere sure. of wealth. So, so you've got to do this balancing act and what's incumbent on the, and what, by collecting the financial information and finding out what the specific needs are and those types of things to determine distributions, you accomplish two things. One, it, 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 the trustee covers his own backside, if you sure. will, uh, showing that he or she have done their due diligence and two, and it will be a difficult process typically at the front end, but it's really critical to set that standard for the beneficiary that this, this, the trust is that, it's a trust. It's not an ATM machine where you put your card in and withdraw whatever you right. want when you want. And that's all about, again, transparency and tons of communication. And I have seen uh, sometimes when the second wife is left nothing because the kids have come in and, and staked their claim is that common or uncommon? Depending should on. be un. It should be the exception and not the rule. And I guess to answer your question more directly, should be uncommon because if the person that drafted the trust, for the you know for the person who created this trust, there should be provisions that are pretty clearly delineated in there that provide for the spouse. And in and, and, and in the typical harmonious you know husband wife situation whether it's a, a first spouse or a second spouse, regardless, sure. there's usually provisions in there that during their lifetime that the primary purpose of the trust shall be for the, for the maintenance of, of, of that surviving spouse. Well, Monty, thank you very much for your time on session two. This is Shane Feely with Beyond the Gavel and Monty Schatz. We'll see you at session three.